Alright, hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia here to sketch with you once again. Um, I uh, really enjoy sketching with all of you, so I'm glad that you are here hanging out with me. Welcome Susan, I see that you're over there in the chat already um, talking a little bit with me. Um, yes, uh, antlions are in the order Neuroptera. So... Let me go ahead and get you that here. That's so big. We're gonna have to. Sh we're gonna have to. Um, and that's yeah. That's how you spell Neuroptera. It just looked a little funny because it was so big. I think. All right. So um, our antlion today is in the order Neuroptera, which means just means that it's a net winged insect. Now. Um, the antlion that we have today is a very large predatory antlion. And yes, all antlions are predatory, right? They're going to be feeding on ants and other small insects. But um, this antlion is one that can be found in the western United States, Colorado, um, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. They come to lights at night, and they're big. Um like <laughs> half the length of my pencil large. Um, I admit I seem to have lost my ruler a little bit back, so um, I don't have... Aha! Uh -huh, I can use this. My paper cutter has a measurement on it. I'm curious to see how exactly lo how long it is. My paper cutter only has inches, but it'll be able to... Uh, darn it! That's fine. Um, let's see. If you compare this antlion to the length of my finger, this antlion is almost the same length as my finger. It's a very, very large specimen. Um, and the antlions that you would have seen that make like the little, the little larval pits, those antlions tend to be smaller adults. Um, this antlion here, when they are, um, when they are immature, when they're nymphs, they actually don't build, uh, pit traps because they are so big. They actually look more like, um, they actually look more like, like green or brown lacewing, um, nymphs. And so when this species, uh, when this species of antlion is immature, they actually go hunting. They go walking around in search of their food rather than pitfalling um, and trapping their specimens. I do have another antlion specimen that's significantly smaller that would have been one of those specimens that had made a pit, but... The wings are a little wonky, and I really love the wings uh, on this specimen, so I figured we would just go with this one. Um, no, I thought I would check one more time, but I don't see it. That's fine. All right, so we've got this really beautiful antlion. Now, it is in the order Neuroptera. That means net wings. Um, but if you wanted to talk about the family that all antlions are in, they're in the family Mermeliontidae. Um, keep in mind, all insect families end in I-D-A-E. Um, and if you look at the... If you look at the, uh, the Latin meaning of Mermeliontidae, mer Mermex, M-Y-R-M-E-X, is, I believe it's Greek, not Latin, but it's Greek for, um, ant, and Leon, uh, means lion. So, they actually just took their common name, well, the scientific name likely came first, so the common name probably was named after it, but... Their scientific name for the family is literally ant lion family. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Um, our specimen has uh, a couple of really unique features. Um, a lot of times when people see ant lions, they think a couple of things. They think, oh my goodness, it could be an owl fly. Although owl flies and ant lions have very different antennae. 
Um, a lot of times the average person might see an antlion like this with these really long wings and maybe even think it was a dragonfly or a damselfly. Um, but dragonflies are going to land with their wings open. Damselflies land with their wings above their bodies. And antlions land with their wings flat like this. All right. So that's one nice way to tell the difference between them just by the overall appeal, by just like looking at their wings and the way that they land. Now, um, owl flies and owl flies and antlions are just an itty bitty bit trickier, but um, I'm sure that you all will be able to uh, look at this. So. Um, your antlions, like this specimen here, have very, very short antenna. So if you compare the length of its antenna, the antenna are probably going to be the length of the combined um, head and thorax, likely. So they're going to be about this long, you know, in comparison. Um, whereas uh, owl flies have long antenna and they have a knob at the end. So antlion antenna, or um, so owl fly antenna, the ones that are long and knobbed at the end, they almost look like butterfly antenna when they're sitting. Um, the other way you're going to be able to tell them apart is actually by the way that they perch. So you can see this antlion is pinned actually in the way that it perches and the way that it just naturally sits. It lay, lay their wings flat right over their body, but, um, and their abdomen stays underneath their wings. When you have, I'm just going to do a really quick light sketch and then erase it, but um, when you have an owl fly, you have a head up here, you've got nice long antenna that are, um, that have these knobs at the end. These are really long antenna. And then the abdomen sticks up like this. And then the wings still come out like this. All right, so um, our wings for an owl fly are going to lay flat like this specimen would, except that when an owl fly lands, it takes its abdomen and it sticks it up over top of the wings and kind of just like sticks its abdomen out there. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose is of that, but that is a natural resting position for an owl fly. Um, and I know that a lot of people, when they first see these really big antlions, they automatically just assume they're owl flies because of, um, because, just because of how large they are. And owl flies do tend to be a little bit bigger. But this is a very special species of antlion that, um, that is predatory and very large and awesome. Now... Oh, no, that's all right, Robin. We appreciate that you're here now. Um, I'm sorry that you had the difficulty with the, uh, with the chat. All right, so up here at the top, I'm going to go ahead and add ant lion up here in our family. Mer I missed the R. Mermeliontidae. Um, and like we said, it's Mermex and Leon, which is ant lion family. <laughs> yeah, I love the family is just literally ant lion. I agree. And I think, you know, when insects have very like obvious family names or like names that just make sense in your head, I feel like they, they just make me smile and they're easier to remember. Um, the other one that makes me that makes me smile is that fireflies are lampirity because they start with lamp. Um, and I, that, that has always just made me smile also. Now, before we really get into sketching this, uh, beautiful antlion, I'm going to flip it over really quick because I want to share something with you. I love antlions from a ventral point of view. I just think they are so cute. All right. Um, they have these, they're so, they look so soft and fluffy, and there's his cute little face, and, um, this specimen only has one antenna left, but, um, 
I I just think he's adorable. All right. And uh, here's something really fun. If you've ever seen um, one of these larger antlions um, in Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, that's generally where they're found. Um, and if you've ever seen one, they... Yes, they're predatory, so I guess they do have the ability to bite, but they're generally not going to. Um, I've handled many of them and have never been bit. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen... Oh, yes. I don't know if any of you have ever seen... There's, like, a famous YouTube video um, from a long time ago, probably over a decade ago, um, where there's this little kitten, and the mom, like, scratches the kitten's belly, and, and then she, like, pulls her hands away really quick, and the, the kitten gets surprised, and her paws go flying back, and then she looks, and then, they like, she tickles again, and then she gets surprised, and it's really cute. Antlions do the same exact thing. If you hold them by their wings and you, like, tickle their little tummies, they'll grab onto your hand um, while they're, like, and if you pull your finger away really quick, all six of their legs go whoop, and um, they they hold them back, and I, I that's just the cutest thing ever. Um, so I'm sure that I, that, um, that this antlion and I had, uh, had, a, had a little bit of fun for a minute. So... And that is our antlion from a ventral point of view. And when they are, you know, going out and predating and finding their food and stuff, you'll notice their head, their, all of their mouth parts are facing downwards. It just helps them, um, helps them to eat. So we're going to sketch it from the top. You know what? We're going to see what happens if we sketch this antlion from a lateral point of view. I've never actually tried. Alright, let's look at it this way. Maybe they should be called ant kittens. I agree with you. I mean, they're both fairly ferocious predatory creatures. He's just so fluffy. He might be a little bit difficult to sketch from a lateral point of view, but I think that it could be fun. So we're going to try. His eyes are so large. Yes. Um, this is a, uh, a lot of times predatory insects need to have really, really large and very, like, specialized eyesight so that they can, um, so that they can see and catch their food properly. But also, this antlion is generally either, um, well, let's just say it this way. I've never seen them flying around during the day. Um, I have only ever really collected this type of antlion at night at gas stations, um, or at night at, like, black lights. And so, generally, I believe that they're most active at night. It's definitely possible that they're active, like, at dawn and dusk, too. But um, I've never ran into this family, I've never run into this type of antlion just flying around during the daytime. Whereas the antlions that are smaller, that make pits, and uh, you can actually find those flying around during the daytime in meadows and fields. Especially around... Um, Especially around uh, sandy environments where their babies can be laid. They could easily be confused for a damselfly. I think so. Um, when we're comparing damselflies versus antlions, the big difference is going to be in the antenna and the way that they... Um, in the antenna and the, the way that they're... Uh, that their wings sit while they're perched. Because a damselfly, I have, I have a damselfly book. This is Dragonflies and Damselflies of the West. Damselflies are going to land with their wings directly over their body, and they're going to kind of um, sandwich them up. Let's see, like this guy here. 
Um, whereas antlions, like this specimen here, they lay their wings flat. Um, the other thing is that when you're looking at a damselfly, it's almost as if they don't have antenna because their antenna are so thin and short that they're practically not visible, especially if you're just out there kind of trying to field identify them. Whereas antlions are going to have fairly obvious antenna in comparison to damselflies. Susan, that is exactly what I mean. There are antlions that both make pits, and there are antlions that don't make pits. This, um, this species, and I'm not sure exactly which species it is. I didn't go through and identify it all the way. But I know that this species, as an immature, as a nymph, does not actually make pits. Um, they are a species of antlion that is... Um, predatory in a different way. They go out and they actually hunt for their food rather than sitting and waiting. And their immature stage, they still look like an antlion, um, but an antlion nymph, but they are a little bit longer and they, they look more active, almost like a baby lacewing or yeah, almost like a baby lacewing. Um, and they're in the same order as lace wings. And so it makes sense that they have some similarities in their immature stage. <clears throat> You've seen the pits in the sand of the pine bush. Very cool. Um, I used to grow up, um, in my backyard in Michigan, we had many, many, many antlion pits. And I used to, uh... Uh, there were a couple of things that I used to do as a kid. Number one is I used to go and collect worms and then dangle the worms in the antlion pits and wait for them to bite and then pull them out, kind of like I was fishing. <laughs> Because I never went fishing as a kid, so I used to, like, make up ways that I could go fishing, like fishing for antlions, um, or I would call, I would call laying in the grass and looking for little itty bitty insects in the grass kind of like fishing for insects, because you never know what's going to walk by, um, just like you don't know what's going to swim by if you're fishing. But, um, yeah, so that's one thing I used to do. The other thing I used to do was then collect them and put them in the sandbox. And then I would feed them. <laughs> so I'd, like, go around and collect as many ant lines as I could, and I'd put them in the little sandbox, and then I would go and, like, collect ants and throw the ants into the sandbox, too. Um, my sandbox was a very active insect home. <laughs> Uh, so I want to give you an overall view of what this insect looks like. It is mostly wings. <coughs> All right. So <clears throat> where you can see the, uh, the pin is through the specimen up here, that's the second segment of the thorax. All right. Um, you have a third segment of the thorax that ends right about here. And then from here all the way to right around here, this is where the abdomen is. You can almost see where that shaded region ends right there. That's where the abdomen ends. And then the wings expand, extend way past um, the body. In fact, give me one moment. I have one of these spread, and I think that you'll be really fascinated to see it. So, you know, normally you do not spread antlions. Um, their wings are just too large. They take up too much space. But I want to show you this. This is the this is the same species. All right? It just has its uh, wings open rather than it having its wings closed. Um, and you can see the, uh, the wings are, are, are giant, giant, giant. Throw a few tiger beetles in the sandbox. You know what? I would have loved to have done that, but I never saw tiger beetles as a kid. I think the first tiger beetle I ever collected was in Lansing after I started college. Um, and I'm not sure why I never saw them. Maybe I just wasn't looking for them. 
And the first tiger beetle I collected, I collected it in my hands. I was so excited that I saw it. I ran up to the light and I grabbed it. And I didn't even think of the fact that they're predatory and they have mean mandibles and all of these things. And it didn't bite me, luckily. But I definitely could have gotten bit just, like, grabbing a tiger beetle like that. I've never seen an antlion adult. Yeah, so they are fairly large. And this is this is the largest species of antlion that I've seen and collected. Um, I do have smaller specimens, but we might as well. Uh, I do have smaller specimens, but I like these ones. So we might as well sketch these. This one that has its wings open was collected in 2010. Oh, this was my first trip to Oak Creek, Arizona. So this is my first, um, that was actually my first road trip, um, across the, uh, across the United States. And I got stopped by the police twice in Oak Creek Canyon that year, um, while I was collecting insects. <laughs> oh, man. It's just a dragonfly with fancy headgear. I love that. Yep, see? Uh, did I miss the size or do you have a ruler? Man, I have a tape measure. I'm going to be right back. because I had lost my ruler and I'm still not exactly sure. Oh, hey guys, it fell off the table. And obviously because it's green, you, you can't, you, this is, this is hilarious, but I promise it's here. Um, <laughs> I found it. No. All right. So If we wanted to give a full-length wingspan on this specimen, from the very tip of the left wing to the very tip of the right wing, the wingspan on this specimen is approximately... I'm going to say 13 centimeters long. 13 centimeters. That is a huge specimen. It's almost, it's pretty much five inches. 13, spec 13 centimeters. Now, if we wanted to do the length of the body, just from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, the specimen is more like... 4.8, like 4.8 centimeters. It looks a little bit shorter when you're looking at it through the video camera, but that's because the abdomen is tilted a little bit away from you at the very end. So you're, um, so, you, so I'm taking into consideration if we straighten the end of that abdomen just a little bit, um, to where it would be kind of sitting, seated, seated naturally. So, you should do what the artist James Gurney does. He has an orange jumpsuit with Department of Art stenciled on it. Like when I, like when I go collecting, um, just putting, like, wearing a big shirt that says 
I'm just collecting bugs or something like that. I I only wear insect t-shirts when I'm going out collecting. And so I figure if I'm wearing an insect t-shirt and I have insect specimens in my pockets and I'm carrying a bug net, then I can't look too scary. Like, I swear I'm not going to... I, I had one officer in, in Utah once ask me why I was, like, scoping out a gas station. And I told him, I was like, I'm not looking into the gas station. I'm collecting the insects off of the window of the gas station <laughs> and uh he didn't he didn't get the uh the humor in that so alas a vest with official entomologists on it for when i'm collecting that could be cool too um <laughs> that could be fun um, and, and I, and I should just make some, like, Insectopia shirts that, um, that say something of the sort, because then I'm almost like a walking billboard, too, huh? Um, this specimen, the one that we're sketching, is gonna be approximately the same, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Good, good, good. All right, so that gives you an idea of the overall shape. I do want to sketch, we're going to try and sketch this specimen from a lateral point of view. Um, the likelihood is that our, is that it's not going to take too long because there aren't a whole lot of details to catch from this side, but what we can do is sketch their lateral point of view and then flip him over and sketch his face because that's really what I want to draw anyway. I want to draw his head with all of his cool mouth parts and his little fluffy legs. Oh, I love him. Okay. A t-shirt doesn't look official enough. Oh, you're right. You're right. I would need some type of, like... You're right. I need a special bug vest. What species is this? You know what? Um, I believe we can find that really quickly. I didn't look at it before the... Um, I didn't identify it before our class today, but I don't believe that there are very many of these really large owl flies out, or, or um, antlions out in Colorado. Let's see. <laughs> and actually, this one was collected in Arizona, so I'm just going to go ahead and write Arizona. Um, and if we can't get it to species, I believe we'll be able to get it to genus. It's Velophallax. That's what it is. Yeah. I recognize that. Okay, so, um, the, we do have a species name. Velophallax. They tend to be fairly large, and they um, they're regularly they're regularly noticed because they're such a large insect, and they come at night. So you'll find them around gas stations and the like. And so people have seen these. Even if you're not an entomologist, if you're living in a state where this species exists, you've likely seen it. All right, so um, we're gonna go ahead and and, and get our sketch started. Um, it. With specimens like this, where their wings are so incredibly long, um, sometimes for me it's a little bit more difficult to get an idea of um, of where the head should end and where the wings should end. So what I'm going to do is just measure our specimen from the front of the head to the back of the wings. Um, that's going to be a, just a slightly different measurement from before because they're closed. So we're looking at from the front of the head to the back of the wings is about 7.3, 7.3 centimeters. Um, the head and thorax combined are about 
1.4 or 1.5. So if we called that 1.5 and, and 7, those numbers go into each other well. Um, ish. 1.5, 3, 4.5. Six, seven. So the head is going to be about a fit. We're going to call it a fifth. It's a little bit less than a quarter of the length. So if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to try and make sure that your specimen stayed um, accurate, what I'm going to do is just create myself. I'm going to give myself a really light line here. And I'm just going to be marking essentially from how, how long I want my specimen from the front of the head to the back of the wings. And then I'm going to divide it into, I'm going to divide it into fifths. So we've got one in the beginning, one in the end. That's four. So one, two, three, four. All right. So what I did is I gave myself a I gave myself a bar, and um, these are all approximate. You can use a ruler and 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 make it exact if you would like. This is kind of just how I'm going to eyeball it today. And so now I know that my specimen is going to start from here, go all the way here with the wings, and then my head and my thorax fits into the first piece here. So the head and the thorax is going to start here. Um, our weight, our body is likely going to come to about the, uh, this notch here. Our, uh, we can call it the third notch. And then the wings expand all the way to the end. And so that's, I guess, how I, how I'm going to start. About a fifth. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. All right, so up here in the front, um, giant eyes. Um, the better to see you with. And so I'm just going to start with a really light outline of this nice pretty circle. And the, um, the head and the mouth parts do face down, and we can see them a little bit from this lateral point of view. They're right around here. And so um, the head is going to be coming down kind of like... Kind of like this, all right. And so that's just gonna give me um, give me a baseline. Um, I didn't include the antennal length um, in our in our estimate, but we did say that the antenna is approximately the same length as the head and the pronotum combined. So we can take your antenna are likely going to be just around that long. Long enough for them to be existent, but not so long as um, an owl fly might be. All right. Um, with our, with the pronotum, or the first segment of the thorax, hey, where'd you go? All right. He's so fluffy. All right, with this uh, pronotum, it does have a little bit of a lip up here at the top that protects the head. Um, this piece right here is the pronotum. <coughs> so coming up this way. I said the head and the thorax combined was about a fifth. So my head is going to have to be a little bit, my eyes and head have to be just a little bit smaller, I think. More like this. All right. So we've got an eye. We have a head. Um, the shield that's up here on the pronotum is going to be coming up and then kind of rounding itself out like this. Um, so it's going to be mostly flat on the top, and we will look at that once we once we get there. There is some ridging and stuff. We'll be able to zoom in 
when we're checking that out. Um, the first pair of legs is connected to this segment, and they generally do go forward. So you can give yourself little stick legs if you'd like for your femur and your tibia. Um, now, the second segment, um, we're going to just build it out like this. We're going to start from the bottom of this D shape and come out to our first notch here. That is going to end the length of our thorax. So we're going to come out in this direction and then likely just give ourselves a little arch here. Now, the second and third pair of legs are connected to this segment. Um, it's actually the meso and the metathorax. And so our middle legs are going to be coming out like this. And then our hind legs come out closer to the end, more like this. All right, so we have so we have some legs taken care of. Now the wings are actually connected. The first pair of wings are connected to the um, to the first segment of the thorax. So they're going to be connected way up here. And so what we're going to end up doing is kind of sketching these wings starting at the back of this D shape here, and then we're going to arch them all the way to the end of our line here, which is going to be beautiful. I'm sure of it. Um, the tips of the wings do have a little bit of these, like, um, uh, I want to say points. They, I'll show you with the specimen with its wings open. So the tips of the wings, they do have this arch to them, um, and they come to almost sharp points on, on both sides. So they are not like perfectly rounded wings, and when these wings are closed, those points point down. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to scan over our specimen here. Obviously, it's so big that I don't have the ability to fit it all under the microscope at one time. But if we look at the very end of the wings, this is going to help you. Um, this is going to help you understand what they look like at the very end. So they kind of like do this uh, arch down and then point, I guess, up a little bit. So pretty. See, lace wings, um, their wing venation is so beautifully lacy that admittedly it's one of those wing types that's kind of difficult to like give all of the you can't really name the veins. And so what we're going to be doing when we're sketching um, all of this wing venation is we're going to be mostly looking at texture and where the veins are the thickest. So something that you may notice is that we do have this very thick um, lateral vein right here. That is the strongest vein in the wing. It has lots to do with flight. And after that point, the wing bends down and kind of surrounds the specimen. So this, this dark line right here is actually kind of like the corner of the wing. Above, above that point, the wings are flat. And below that point, the wings are kind of curled around the body. Velophallax sounds like a terrible dragon in a fantasy novel. I love that. I would have to agree. I also wonder if it if Vela has any re, um, has any like um, meaning in like velt or felt or like velvety. Oh. Oh, maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe it means beautiful? I'm not sure about that one. All right. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and get our, get our, get our friends started here. So, um, 
instead of doing the abdomen first, I'm doing the wings, and then we'll add the abdomen as kind of a shadow behind the wings. So um, coming up from here, going all the way out to the end of our, to almost the end of our line where, where it's going to do this really pretty curve. And then what I'm going to do actually is take this lateral line here that I used kind of as a middle marker, and that's going to be the side point or the, the lateral line that like really that strong um, lateral vein here. And I'm going to not make it so straight. I'm just going to arch it down a little bit. And admittedly, now that I have, well, we'll leave it for just another moment. All right, so I have this lateral vein that's nice and thick. Um, it's just, I, I, I arched it underneath that line just a little bit. And now I'm going to give our second one, and this is the region of the wing that is curling down. All right, so we've got up here on the top. And then we're going to scooch our specimen to the end so that I can make sure that I get the end of our wings correct. Notice that as this vein gets closer and closer to the end of the wing, it also gets closer to the edge of the wing until it meets right around here, you can see that that really thick vein kind of disappears. It meets the bottom of the wing, and that is when our arch starts. So I am going to do it. I'm going to erase this sketch line. I don't need the length bar anymore. Okay. So um, this is that really pretty lateral line, and right around where our, we were almost ending, that is going to stop and touch this bottom one. And then um, this one on the top comes down and folds up. All right, so that gives us that gives us wing shape. It um, it gives us length of the body. It gives us definitely something to work with. The paper's a lot less scary when you um, when you have a little bit of when you have a little bit of uh, sketch down for you yourself. Now um, I do have a little bit of this line left, and I know this is about where my um, I guess three-fifths would have been, and that is where my abdomen is going to go out to. And I know that we're not going to be able to see the abdomen too well, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of darken this region here so that I know that that's where the abdomen is. And then as we are sketching the, uh, the wing venations over top of it, at least there will be a little bit of a shadow on our specimen, just like um, the shadow on our friend here. All right, it's time to zoom in. All right, I want to look at the eye really quick because I know that there are a couple of you that really like textures. Look at how pretty. I'm just moving the focus really slowly from the top of the eye to the bottom of the eye to give you the idea so that you can see how many individual lenses are in this compound eye. Now, um, compound eyes, right, that's what we would call this. <coughs> <coughs> Um, this is a compound eye, so it has lots and lots of individual lenses within it. Those individual lenses are called omatidia. Um, and so uh, if you don't have that word, now you do. Um, omatidia is the plural form of the individual lens within a compound eye called the omatidium. All right. I 
I wish that there was a way to really get the detail of that eye there. Okay. So, I guess we're gonna zoom out just a little bit. I wanna see most of the head. That's what I was going for. So we'll go right around here. So, <laughs> <coughs> from a lateral point of view, uh, the head is mostly eye. So I'm just going to take our, our nice circle here. I'm actually pretty happy with the shape and size of my eye now that I've, now that I've seen it in comparison to all of the other, um, to the length of the body. So I'm going to come in and just really darken up this shape here and give myself a really solid, large compound eye here. Now there is a little bit of like a, a little bit of depth. You can see that there's a little bit of head just above the compound eye. Um, so you can always give yourself that little bit of a lip here. Um, I'm going to erase any of these sketch lines that ended up inside of my compound eye. And then we're going to work down. Now, um, Vela Phallax, this uh, beautiful antlion, has a yellow face. All right. She also has yellow pelps. Um, pelps are the scientific name for my common name, mouth fingers. Um, and you can actually see one of the pelps here um, in our in our microscope. This little yellow guy right here that's a multi-segmented, those are little mouth fingers. They help push food into their mouths. Guten Morgen, chaos. Long time no see. All right. So our... Um, so the head here is coming down towards the legs, and I'm just going to kind of add this shape in here, and then I'm going to add our, um, our palps, these little mouth fingers. And the mouth fingers are going to be coming off of, they actually have four palps. They have two labial palps and two maxillary palps, so they're kind of like this. Um, but I think that the one we're seeing is a labial palp. It looks like it's coming off of the bottom. So um, we're going to give it one, two, three segmented palp right here. Um, I also want to come in here and, cro and cross hatch within the compound eye just to show out, um, just to show off some of that, um, some of that character. I'm going to get rid of this like light leg sketch really quick. So we've got, we've got the head, we have the mouth taken care of. Um, that is okay, chaos. I, um, have been sick on and off too. So I have, um, actually also missed a couple of live streams in the last couple of weeks. I'm definitely on the mend, which makes me really happy. I have a, a lingering cough that I'm sure a number of you have, have heard now, but, um, I'm feeling much, much better. Um, so I hope to continue to improve and not miss any more classes for a while, because I, um, these are one of the things I absolutely love to do. All right. So our antenna are going to be connected, the antenna of the antlion are connected um, about two-thirds of the way down our eye right here. So I'm going to actually start it a little lower than I originally had it. Um, antlion antenna tend to be kind of thick, all right? Um, and the other thing, I do believe they're mostly hooked. Um, this specimen's antennae... Um, this specimen's antennae doesn't look as hooked as most antlion antennae that I can think of. Yeah, I think that what happened is that this specimen's antenna ended up kind of, um, I don't know. You see it kind of like curled over on itself? So I'm going to show you what they look like normally. Um, they're kind of thick. Right. Doop, doop, doop. 
I want to have the first one um, just as like a, I, I'm using the first one just as a, a length test. And then this second line, you can see that the antennae are actually, they're, they're kind of, they're kind of thick. But then once you get to the end, a lot of times they have this like, more like, uh, if he was holding it over his head, I'm trying to make sure that the hook is going in the right direction, because normally they go kind of away from their head, so if you were looking, I don't know, if you were looking at an antlion from the top, their antennae, a lot of times, look like this, where they have these hooks at the end, and so maybe that's what we're seeing, because we're looking at it from a lateral point of view, it's actually kind of turning and, and hooking towards us. Um, and they almost expand a little bit at the end, too, so they start a little bit narrower, and then they kind of widen out a little bit, so we're going to see how, how close we can get to... Yes, like, kind of like, kind of like that. That's how I'm going to leave mine. I'm going to fix right in here in the middle of the antenna. But um, that is going to be, I'm going to be pretty happy with that. I'm going to fix this just for a moment. Yeah, kind of like that. So um, if you're looking at it from a dorsal or a top point of view, it would be kind of like this. From my lateral point of view, I'm just going to make sure that it hooks up a little bit. And then the number of segments does not particularly matter in antlions, for at least what I know. Um, and many of the antlions will actually also have... There are many antlions that also appear to have very striped antenna so sometimes in between the segments they'll be kind of like a yellow or a whiter color you have three antlion specimens in your house chaos that's really cool all right now that we are Moving on back, I just want to, we're going to be sketching from the front to the end today, so instead of doing the body and the wings, I would like to do the legs as we go through our specimen today. Um, we are going to be scooching on through, so you will be able to see the, uh, the veins and the colors and the wings. Just stick around with us and you'll be able to see them, I promise. Um, now with this pronotum section, this is the first section of the thorax and it's on the top. It's that top sclerite or, um, the sclerite is just a piece of exoskeleton, like a piece of armor. Um... And it does kind of arch and protect this head just a little bit. But now that we are zoomed in, you'll notice that this, um, that the pronotum isn't exactly straight across the top. There is some kind of structuring here, some ridges. I was hoping, there we go. Very good. So now you can see that there is this little bit of structuring where you've got up in the top, and then we're going to give it just a little bit of a hill right here in the center before you come back up. So you're going to go something like this. And admittedly, when I zoomed in, I didn't expect it to remind me of a cat head, but it does. It reminds me of, like, two little ears on a cat head. <laughs> That's kind of cute. Um... And then uh, the bottom of our pronotum is this very even kind of arch here. So we've got that taken care of. And then we'll be able to scooch our specimen down and really look at our leggies. Now, um, it's very difficult to see the lateral of our thorax here because the legs are so fluffy and, um, like, they, uh, 
we're gonna say setos. The legs are super setos, and um, uh, it, they make it almost difficult to see all of the other parts, which is kind of funny. Um, I do know that there is a coxy in there somewhere, so um, that's like a hip bone, and it's likely angled like this. All right, so you've got this kind of angled rectangular box, and that's where our femur is going to be coming out of. Um, I do believe that when we sketch our femur, well, how we're going to end up doing it is we're going to be going a little bit over top of this eye and coming up here because that's just how he's, that's just how they're positioned when we're, when, when we're looking at them from this angle. So I'm going to take the femur and bring it up bring it up like this and I'm going to erase any of these lines within the femur all right so we've got the femur that's kind of coming up towards um the compound eye and then our tibia is going to be coming down and it's going to mess a little bit with the with the these mouth parts here but I'm okay with that because we weren't able to see the mouth parts super distinctly anyway so um, our, I'm going to let my leg kind of fall this way and I'm going to try not to let it affect too much of the eye because I love that giant compound eye there. And I'm still going to allow this, um, pelp to be visible from underneath. So now we have that coxal segment, we have the femur coming up, the tibia coming down, and all we need to see are the tarsal segments, those little toe segments. And the little tarsal segments are difficult to see from a lateral point of view, but if we turn our specimen so that we're looking at it from my favorite point of view. <laughs> We can see tarsal segments. <clears throat> now there's a part of me that kind of wonders what's going on. I admit, maybe I haven't really looked at the tarsal segments of this antlion before. That's wild. Okay. Oh, don't move, friend. I think I'm only seeing two tarsal segments. And I expected there to be more. Um, so here's what I'm looking at. I wanted to just show you. Um, right around here, you can see this dark, um, arch there. That is at the end of the tibia, and it almost looks like tarsal claws. Like, normally when we have tibial spines, they're kind of straight or they're a spur, um, and they can move, but that almost looks like an additional claw, which kind of threw me off for a loop for a minute. And there's two of them. There's one on this side, and there's one actually on the other side. And if I was going to take a guess, if I was going to take a shot in the dark, I would guess that those are beneficial for catching and holding on to prey. So that's the end of the tibia. This segment right here is a tarsal segment. And it has, it's fairly setose. It's fairly hairy. And then at the very end, you have two additional, you have two real tarsal claws right around here, these two. And they look very similar to those spines. So it's almost like they're, they have like these double claws. Um, and I was trying to tell if there are two tarsal segments there or if it's just one long one. And I think that I can I'm not sure. Well, there's always 
more to learn when you're talking insects, and that's one of the things I love. I found someone named Spider ID in Twitch. He is from Europe, and he classifies and identifies spiders. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check him out. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself this little tarsal segment here, and I'm going to sketch it just the way I see it, which is only one. And I'm not sure there's de it def there definitely could be more than one tarsal segment, and I feel like there should be at least two. Um, but that's not what I'm seeing. So um, here at the very end of our tibia, we are going to add these two claws... And they are going in the same direction that the tarsal claws are. So instead of coming out from the bottom, they're actually more like... That's crazy. They're more like that, where you've got... Um, where you've got uh, what almost looks like a claw pointing down here at the end of the tibia, and then two more at the end of the tarsal segment. And there's two actually here at the end of the tibia, but the other one is behind it because we're drawing it from a lateral, so um, you can't really see it as much. Now, I'm leaving out the hairs because I think that I'm, I'm a fan of these like very strong lines, and I think the hairs would kind of get in the way of um, detail. Although... The hairs may add detail. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. And let's go ahead and move on back to the, uh, we're going to switch on over and check out our middle legs and start looking at where the wings are connected. of this middle section of our specimen here. The, um, once you get past the pronotum here, you can see that the rest of this thorax is very textured, almost mountainy or hilly up here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and give us some, some kind of some texturing up here. Um, and this is also where our wing is connected. Now keep in mind that that dark vein right there, we wanted to make sure that we kept that darker vein separate from the top and the bottom because that's the edge of the wing here. That's where that wing is actually bending. So I'm going to start there at that really dark vein and that's where I'm going to be basing a lot of my wing stuff off of. So I've got here in the middle and then underneath that, I want, it, I want it to meet at the base, but then separate fairly quickly. And now we have these two guys. I'm going to erase some of these sketch lines because I think that it's getting just a little bit too busy here. So we've got this happening. Now, um, we also have the top of our wing. And the wings, they do meet and they reach, uh, and they, and they kind of go flat on the top of the body. So, um, it's also all going to be connected to this point here. So instead of, uh, so instead of starting it at a different place, all three of these lines should merge right here and they are connected or touching our pronotum. All right, and then our line is going to come up and just slightly over top of where your, um, yeah, just slightly over top of where your thorax is. And that's where I'm going to pause my sketch for the wing here. And I want to get the rest of our body and our legs taken care of. You're going to move out to Marseille. That's exciting. I hope it's um, all good reasons that you are having the opportunity to move. 
Um, I'm actually moving in the first week of April, and so I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to have my computer and stuff set up on that Thursday, um, but likely that first Sunday in April, or the last Sunday in March, March 31st, April 2nd, something in there, that Sunday I'm likely not going to be live streaming because my computer and microscope and everything will be packed up. All right, so um, for our thorax here, I'm just going to give kind of the bottom of the body, and our coxal segments or these hip bones, they all kind of angle backwards. So I can take right um, about right after this wing, um, right around here, maybe you can measure it right at the half point of of um, this mountainous region here, the rest of our thorax, and you're going to create kind of this diagonal line here. And that is going to be where the middle leg gets connected. Right there. You're going to be connecting our middle leg right around here, and the middle leg is going to be moving um, backwards rather than forwards, right? So just to create... Um, just to create stability, insects have their front legs put it posted forwards and their middle and their hind legs go backwards. Now, I do want to finish this thorax and kind of add where the, um, and add where the, the hind legs are going to be coming out. So, if we take this angle here, we're actually going to be kind of making it go a little bit more narrow, and I'm going to lengthen the thorax just a little bit longer than I had originally had. So, right around here, that's where my thorax is going to end. Um, and you can see that it, it kind of like, it narrows a little bit to, to connect to, to the abdomen. And this is where the hind leg is going to connect to, except... Um, we need a coxal segment still in here, and so it's going to be almost like this little triangle here. And then our femur is going to be coming out away from that and down and over. So that's kind of the overall shape we're going to be looking for. Now let's do our middle leg, and then we can do our hind leg. Ooh, I bumped my finger earlier. I wonder when I scraped my finger. Okay, so our middle leg here, the middle leg you can actually see on our microscope image too, it's right here. And admittedly, the tarsal segments on our middle leg on the pin specimen are going forward. That is not their natural pose, naturally they're going backward. So I'm going to make sure that our specimen that we're sketching is looking more natural. So we take it here. We go, the femur is going to come up towards the wings, kind of like this. And I'm glad that we had our wings all figured out because now we're going to be erasing some of it. Yikes. All right. So we have this, the femur here that kind of comes back and up. And the tibia is going to be coming down. And admittedly, I think that normally it would stretch out just a little bit more, but I want to make sure I'm leaving room for my hind leg too. And this is still a natural pose. So I'm going to let it, I'm going to let it sit like this. So we have our middle leg coming out and back and then I'm going to imagine our tarsal segments coming kind of towards the camera so we're going to be doing them more like this um, and it appears that the tarsal segments on the middle leg are very similar to the tarsal segments on the front leg But, I mean, look at those claws. I'm not seeing those really strong claws at the end of the tibia, but it is possible that they are there and just hidden within all of that hair. What I am going to make sure is I'm going to make sure that I add those um, that tarsal segment here and those very strong claws. <laughs> Mm 
All right, so we've got the middle legs. Now, the hind legs, you'll have noticed now that that coxal plate, that triangle that we added there is now gone. That's just because our, um, I'm not happy with the leg. I want to fix it. I'm going to fix it really quick. I think that I made the tibia just a little bit too long. I want to make sure that our specimen doesn't look too long-legged. That's better. All right, so now our hind leg here is, I believe the hind leg is actually significantly longer than the middle leg. There is a claw or something sticking out in the back right side of the screen. There is! It's hidden amongst the hair! It's right here! We're going to flip her over and see if we can see it better from the, from the ventral. There totally is. Check that out. Oh, um, what you guys see and what I see through the microscope are slightly different. So sometimes I'll have focused and I think that you're seeing what I'm seeing. And then I realize you're just an itty bitty bit off. There we go. So this is what the end of the tibia looks like. You've got, this is our tibia. Those two crazy claws coming out actually kind of surround that tarsal segment here. Kind of like this. And then you've got the, and then you've got the tarsal claws down here. That's so cool. And gnarly. Like, I, I feel like this, I feel like if, if I was an ant or a small insect and I saw this insect flying towards me, I'd be like, nah, -uh, I'm going the other way. Um, now that we're looking at a bottom point of view, I just want to um, kind of look at the hind legs while we're here. Um, I do want to show you this little yellow patch here that almost looks like uh, triangular right here. That's the coxal segment, and that's that triangular segment I tried to add, and then we had to erase for the middle leg anyway. Um, but we have our hind legs, and the hind legs also seem to have that same awesome looking kind of double spine. So cool. All three pairs of legs. Now at this point, you'll notice that the legs are actually hidden kind of underneath the wings rather than coming around the wings. The wings do kind of form a shield around the legs. And admittedly, I think that might be why I feel weird about this is because the legs normally tuck up underneath the wings or don't really interact with the wings up here as much. So I'm going to see what I can do about just shortening. And it's, I think it's fine if the middle legs go over, but the hind legs definitely shouldn't. So instead of me drawing the hind legs on top, I'm just going to be adding um, where the tibia would be coming down. So we've got the femur. It would start right around here in the middle of the, <laughs> right around here. The femur would come up in this direction and come down and so our um, our final pair of legs is actually going to be coming out right around here and we're going to make sure that it is strongly angled all right so we've got a leg here and we've got those two claws at the end of that that's actually the tibia and then you have the tarsal segment with two more claws Okay. 
All right, so I'm pretty happy with our head and our thoracic region. I'm going to solidify some, a couple of these lines, and I'm going to darken right here and here, and then I think we're good. So um, now we get to really look at the wings and, um, and add some of those details, too. Ant lions were like, 12 claws are not enough. I must have 24. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm honestly, I'm, I'm not sure if it's all ant lions or if it's just this species, if that's something that makes this species unique or not. Um, I couldn't tell you. They're so pretty, though. All right, so giving you an idea of what the wing venation looks like on our antlion, um, I'm going to start with these cross veins down here. Now, in net-winged insects, regularly we are comparing kind of how the veins branch and not as much what the names of the veins are or how many there are. But if they are straight and individual, or if they are creating Ys and those types of things, if they are incredibly arched or if they're straight. And so those are the types of characteristics and features that we're looking for in these wings. Um, and so we'll notice that up until about where the hind leg comes off from this strong lateral vein here, we have lots of cross veins, but these cross veins, they don't really start branching or Ying or, or creating these like Ys until after until after that hind wing. And then they're solid, they're individual on the top, and then they Y. Um, and then they Y going towards the edge. And they, yes, seem to have um, leopard print veins. Yes, they have these like really cool mottled colors. Um, now our veins are also, let's see, <laughs> I'm just going to erase that. I mean, we don't need that. <coughs> All right. Um, our veins are going to be kind of radiating from this point here, too. So you can kind of create yourself. We're going to have this, I believe. I wanna, let me double check really quick. No, it might not be as true as I thought. They're actually straighter than that. I had always imagined them angled like that, but I think that that's because maybe that's what they look like from the top. From the side, they're actually a little straighter, so let's see. I am pretty happy, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm pretty happy with the overall outline of my wings here. Um, what I want to do is pull this specimen here. Um, this is our... This is our friend with the uh, full length wings that are spread, and I figured we might as well look so that you can see what I'm kind of talking about when I talk about straight versus branching and Ying. So here, let's see, we're going to go to the front, there we go. So right here, this is where um, that solid line is, that lateral one is, and you've got the straight ones until a point, and then they all start to Y and branch, and maybe not all of them, um, so you can kind of intermix and match them. The rest of these veins, you can see they are very well knit, um, and there's many, many cross veins. I just love the shaping and the configuration of them, and then once you get to the very, very end of the wings. Go wings, go! Aha! You end up with um, a stronger angle, and these guys here are very, very fine veins, all the way up to the very tip where you almost have a point on the wing. And so when I sketch mine from a um, lateral point of view, that point kind of comes up like this. 
So I'm happy with the overall shape of my wings. I'm going to darken this line here all the way across. I'm going to bring it down and kind of arch it up. And then um, we're going to add the wing venation within this outline. So we've got this taken care of. Now, um, you'll notice that I kind of, I stopped right around here. You can see that there's this like, um, symmetry happening where once this one kind of arches, this one starts to arch up too. Um, at this point where it's kind of done arching, that's where the lateral is meeting the edge. Um, and I'm, and admittedly, I think there is an actual true name for that vein and I'm not sure what it's called. It could be the Costa, but I'm not sure. But that, um, that, that, that solid one is going to angle down. And then this bottom one here is going to hold that space and also meet here in the center. All right. So you end up with this happening. Uh, you've got all of these little cross veins that turn into Y's. Some of them turn into Y's. Some of them cross happening along the bottom. And then now we'll be able to look at our specimen on the lateral for our wing venation happenings. I also think that there is like, a, I also think that the wings are slightly setos. Every now and again when I'm looking at the wings, I feel like I'm seeing little bits of hairs. Yeah, this specimen, this is one of the big predatory ones. This is kind one of one of, one of the big ones. Um, many, many antlions, and this one actually, it flies at night too. Um, whereas many antlions uh, fly during the day and they spend their time in meadows and flowers and those types of things, this one is a little bit more aggressive. And their nymphs don't actually make um, the sand pits like all of the other antlions do because their, um, their nymphs are, they actually go out and hunt for their food. Um, so if you look very closely, especially on some of these veins here and here, and I believe that this is the case for the entire wing, there are very, very small insect hairs or CT along all of these little veins. So what I want to do is I want to start my wing venation from the edge and work my way back towards the body. It's just how I'm feeling right now. So um, I'm going to take right around here our point where this, um, this, this, this very strong vein kind of ends. And this is going to start kind of branching up. Yeah, like this. Ah. Sorry, my, my lumber grasshoppers are in the way, so I'm going to move them. Ah. There we go. All right, so um, coming up here, I'm thinking that I'm just going to be creating some of these very light lines and I'm going to um, almost make them look hairy but what I want to do is just make sure that the veins are all going in the correct direction and then give them some crosses here. Let's see. And we can see that these veins here at the very tip are very, very thin. So my goal is not to count and name and number all of these, but to just give the appearance of texture. 
Um, and then after we get past this point here, where you have lots and lots of the little veins, we can start giving more and more space and kind of darkening these veins throughout. Um, what I'm going to end up doing, I think, just to create... Um, and just to create our textured look, I'm going to take our veins and I'm going to just run them lengthwise. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Something along this lines. And then I'm going to go ahead and start giving these crosses. And wherever I think that there is a, a cross vein that maybe is a little bit too long, it's leaving too much space, I'm going to take another long vein and add it in. Um, so that you're not only creating um, this net pattern, but you're also making the, uh, the space in between the veins shorter and shorter as you're going towards the end. And I know that this may not be ideal if you're trying to identify the specimen to species based on your sketch, but I think that it will give us an overall appealing look for our beautiful ant lion that we've been sketching. Look how cute he is. I'm so happy with him. I didn't draw, I actually erased the shaded part where his abdomen was because I was having just too much fun uh, um, adding the adding the wings. So now, I think I am going to though. So let's see. I try to I try um, to know as much about the insects as I can before before chatting about them um, and I believe I was always told by other entomologists that they are hunters um, and so I don't think that I'm incorrect but when I have people double check me I always like to double check myself too I I believe that they are hunters. They are definitely hunters. They are definitely hunters as immatures where they're walking around and they don't make, um, and they don't make the, um, the, the nets or anything like that. And I, I do believe they, they generally are night flying. And so they're flying to lights and the like, um, pretty awesome, crazy creatures. Love them. Okay, so I'm gonna add the um, I'm gonna add our um, like the region for our abdomen. Um, I was trying to find a good way to show you how long the abdomen is, but I think what we're gonna end up doing is just doing it on our thing. Um, remember when we had divided our specimen into five, the abdomen is about three-fifths of the specimen, so the abdomen's gonna come out to around about here, and I'm just gonna make it kind of this darker shadow behind the wings. So I'm gonna take this space here, And I'm just going to darken a region of the, the wings right here so that I can say, yes, this specimen does have an abdomen, I promise. And the abdomen is nowhere near as long as the wings are. He's so cute.
so you've got me looking up. So you have me looking up antlion adults. Versus nymphs. See, I'm always learning new things too. And um, as it turns out, <laughs> my goodness, I really thought that they were predators all throughout their lives. It looks like they do need a protein source though. So, um, yeah, as adults, they're chewing on pollen and nectar. But then why are they out flying around at nighttime? Some species eat small arthropods and some eat nectar and pollen. Okay. All right. So I'm not crazy. <laughs> Okay, so it goes both ways, depending on the species. Um, this one is Velophallax, and so I believe that they would be feeding on very small insects, like small, non, um, I would imagine them eating, uh, I've always imagined them, like, going to lights and finding like the little flies or like the little itty bitty insects that are kind of like flying around the lights and they'll walk around like these really big tanks and they'll feed on things um and so that's what you mean the predatory ones yeah so the the predatory guys that are are feeding i believe they're just feeding on all of like the little small soft bodied insects that aren't like super fast right because you are correct with these crazy big wings they don't have really great flight they do have really great eyesight um they have really good eyesight and they don't uh they don't like fly too well they don't fly like a dragonfly right they more kind of flutter like an antlion or like a like other um net winged insects do um but yes they are going to be they're gonna be predatory and even and um i wouldn't be surprised if you saw them feeding on like feeding on feeding on things that are pretty much non-moving like walking around on the walls just like walking around and eating the little the little itty bitty guys all righty yay Uh, thank you, Robin, for looking it up and, and, um, and checking to see in both directions. We really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, where I try and stay as informed on insects as possible, I have all of the learning left to do, too. Yes? Um, no one single person can be considered an entomologist. The topic is just too grasped for one individual human to understand. Right? So, um... I will I continue my learning, and I do believe that they are, they're definitely going to be feeding on, uh, they're probably going to feed on it all, you know, but, um, they're, they're these, they're mean predators out there, out in the West. It's very cool. Uh, all right. I am pretty happy with our specimen here. I know I mentioned that, I know that I mentioned that, I wanted to flip him over and draw him from a head-on point of view and kind of show off his cute little mouth parts and stuff. And, uh, we can still look at him from an upside-down point of view, but I'm thinking that... I'm thinking that we take a pause because we've been here for about an hour and a half now, and this has been great. Um, but I am recovering from um, being sick for a little bit of time, and so I'm hoping to get a little bit of a good night's sleep tonight before I uh, before we start again tomorrow. So, 
<laughs> Agreed. Too big a topic. Yeah, that's actually a famous quote that sat in the entomology lab at MSU and is one that's always stuck with me because it keeps you, you know, it keeps you grounded a little bit. You can get lost, or I, I can get lost in the, um, in the information about insects out there. And I have books and books and books and I, um... I, uh, I have many of them still yet to read, uh, so uh, this is good. All right, we'll have a quick look. Sounds good, Susan. Look at how cute it is. Look at how cute she is. So you can see those giant compound eyes. You can see those palps. And now that we're looking at it from this point of view, we can see both pairs. Um, the uh, when I say palps, the we're talking about those little yellow segments up um, near the mouth of my insect. Um, these two here that are closer to the microscope, though, are closer to the camera. Those are the maxillary palps, and they sit right underneath the mandibles. So we've got the mandibles sitting right around here. You have the maxillary palps sitting right around here. And then this long one here, and there is another long one likely covered by this leg here. And those are the labial palps. And the labial palps are the ones that are on the bottom jaw of the antlion's chewing mouth parts. And that's the one that we were able to see from our lateral point of view. So we were looking at the labial palps coming off from the bottom. Ooh, are there ocelli? Looks like at least one above the antenna. Let me go look. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I do not think that our specimen has ocelli. Um, I... I think that what we were seeing was just a little bit of texturing. Yeah. So there are no ocelli, no simple, uh, wait a minute. No. That's just a glare. That's not an ocelli. So there are no simple eyes on, on her head, on the top or in the front. Um, but what we, when we were looking at her from the underside, you can see the scape and the pedestal um, on the left side. Here's something kind of funny. <coughs> we talk about the three segments of the antenna, right? The scape, the pedestal, and the flagellum. Well, the flagellum broke off of this side, but you can still see the scape and the pedestal. So that tells you something about the structural integrity of the first couple segments of the antenna versus the remainder of the segments of the antenna. I wish I had that video of me tickling an antlion's tummy still. I'm definitely going to have to do it again when we're out west. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll post it as like a, a YouTube short or something. How cute he is. Okay. All right, so that is our, uh, our beautiful antlion specimen. I'm so excited that I was able to share that. To, to share this guy with you today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open my closer. Here we are. Oh, you can see magic. Ah. All right, very good. <laughs> um, so I want to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll go ahead and I'll show it to you this way. This is my final sketch here. Um, 
Uh, I love the proportions on this guy. I think that that's something that I'm personally still working on is making sure like proportionally he's correct. And starting with that bar and making sure that his head and his thorax was about a fifth of the length of its entire body was a really, really cool thing to do. So that was fun. Um, I teach on a platform called OutSchool. Uh, this is for students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, and I also teach a teenage class now for 13 to 17. Um, that's like a college entomology prep class. Um, I actually just started my first session there, and I have my first Australian student, so I'm all excited about that. Um, but uh, if you know any students anywhere around the world that love to talk about bugs and uh, want to learn a little bit more, they I have classes throughout school that um, are Zoom classes, and we get to interact and see each other's faces and talk about bugs and either draw or um, we were focusing on click beetles today. So let's see. We did. I can even show you because it's right here in the same book. We talked about click beetles today, and so we got to talk about the different body parts, and then we talked about how they click and what their life history looks like, and then I got to, I like to talk about two different click beetles. We talked about the eastern-eyed click beetle with the fake eyes, and then we talked about the bioluminescent click beetles. Um, really cool. I collected bioluminescent click beetles in western Texas once and that was a lot of fun. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I know all of you out there who have been messaging and chatting with me during this session, you are all subscribed so I super appreciate it. If you've just been kind of hanging out and watching and listening and you think maybe I do want to get a notification the next time she does this, go ahead and press the subscribe button and the little notification bell. Um, down here is a link to my PayPal account where you can kindly donate a couple of dollars to Insectopia and help me keep my help me keep my collection nice and purchase new pins and keep the and keep the upkeep going. I'm gonna have to buy PDB fairly shortly. Um, so thank you so much. This is at Insectopia 2015 is actually my Instagram and my Facebook tag. So if you were ever looking for me, you have to add 2015. It's the year that I uh, established the name and um, someone had already taken Insectopia, silly people. All right, so, and if you would like to share your sketch with me, I love seeing your sketches, and I know a number of you um, do regularly share your sketches with me, so I want to say thank you for those of you who do, and if you don't, you can feel free to. That's my email address. You can just email Trisha at theinsectopia.com, and you'll get me, and um, I love chatting with all of you. And I even have pen pals from around the world now from these YouTube videos, from these YouTube live streams. So, um, I want to thank you all. Very cool. A favorite when I see them. Yes, exactly. I have, um, my click beetle drawer is out right now, and there's not only click beetles in here, but the first, uh, row and a half are all click beetles. Um, and even though they're all very similar, like brown, they all kind of, like from here on, you know, they all look very, very similar when you're just looking at them in a unit tray. But if you zoom in on them, they all have different hair types. They have different patterns on their elytra. They have different antennal types. And I had no idea the uh, amount of variation within little brown click beetles until I started like really collecting them. And this big one right here is a diplostethus. It's even bigger than the eastern-eyed click beetle, and I always thought that that was really cool, too. The Ida later once. Yes, exactly. And you know, um, there are two species of eyed click beetles in Pennsylvania. I only have one of them so far. So there's actually another species of eyed click beetle that is a little bit more rare, um, but can be found in my local habitat. So um, there are still things for me out there to go and find. <laughs> All right. Um, and I am going to attempt to find myself a mayfly or two so that we can sketch those. I admittedly, I just couldn't find um I know I have a mayfly specimen in a vial, I've, and I've even seen it recently, but um, 
where the vial is supposed to be is a little empty hole right now. So I must have taken out and looked at it and didn't put it back. But that's okay. We will find it one day. Um, and if not, I will... We're going to fill a couple of the holes I have in my collection to make sure that we can cover even more families of insects in the spring. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, so much for hanging out with me and having a good time and sketching the antlion with me. Um, feel free to, uh, to join me any Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern or... Um, Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern time zone. Uh, man, we have a good time. So I look forward to seeing you all again and have a wonderful rest of your night. Stay buggy. Bye.